So, um, as Bjorn mentioned, you know, don't think of this as a keynote. Um, think of this more as an asylum application. Um, you know, we have some problems in our small island, and uh, so we're very keen to make connections outside of it. Um, so, um, a quick question before we start. So, who here would see themselves as being part of some kind of digital transformation process in their organization? Oh, great, that's really encouraging. Um, who here works on, let's say, collaboration platforms or enterprise social networks? Okay, and who here is uh, sort of operating more within the realm of intranets? So I was saying, who, who is sort of maybe doesn't, ha doesn't work on an ESN but works on an intranet? Okay, great. That's a really uh, interesting uh, spread of people. Uh, thanks for that. So as I said to Bjorn, you know, we talk a lot about digital transformation. We talk a lot about the digital enterprise. Um, but I think there are some, if you, if you work with sort of advanced companies in this field who've been on this journey for the last five to 10 years, then you can see that we're hitting some very, very strong barriers. And this is the reason for my talk. Um, I want to discuss two fundamental elements that we need in order to create a digital enterprise. One is what I'm calling um, an operating system for the organization, and the other is an operating model. In other words, a way of operating that system. Uh, and I hope that will become uh, clearer as we go through. So uh, by way of introduction, um, we've been uh, working with social technology in organizations since 2002. Uh, we set up the first European uh, consultancy to do that called Headshift, um, worked on you know, a load of projects from the technical point of view, getting these technologies inside the organization. But then when we stopped and reflected, we realized that uh, you know, we hadn't changed the world. Uh, we'd simply brought a new class of technology into some very bureaucratic organizations. And so we figured the next phase of our career is all about, if I'm honest, sort of forcing uh, management and leadership of these organizations to accept that they really need to address the organizational structural culture and practice issues which are necessary uh, to create a new and modern way of working. So we're very lucky. We've worked with lots of organizations um, here in Germany. We've been working very deeply with Bosch in the last sort of four, four and a half years, but also Siemens and Daimler and Eon and various other companies. You know, you're lucky that you still have uh, an industrial manufacturing base, which we don't have. So we have to travel uh, to do that stuff. In Switzerland, it's banks. In the UK, it's law firms. Um, and uh, in Scandinavia, it's a, a, a more mixed picture of organizations. But thankfully, uh, many companies have allowed us this experience of sort of seeing inside the challenges and seeing inside what they're doing. And that's really what this talk is, um, is based on. So if we look at social technology, obviously, um, it's not the destination. Um, it's just an enabler. It's a very, very basic prerequisite uh, for new forms of organizational design, new structures, uh, you know, new ways of organizing the company. And even that is really a precursor to what we loosely describe as the future of work. So if we think about the sort of new jobs, new roles, new ways of working, all of that depends on better structures. And the better structures can only be achieved uh, through making better use of social and digital and emerging technology. So we have social technology in the workplace. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, if you look at studies like this one, you'll see that the adoption has been you know, relatively quick in the early stages, but many uh, of these platforms are hitting an adoption plateau. Um, so they're getting to the level of usage, um, but the use cases are not strong enough, the impact is not strong enough, or perhaps work happens somewhere else, not in the enterprise social network, and that provides a real barrier uh, to further progress. Um, if we look at, you know, there's a million different research reports about uh, the changing nature of the digital enterprise. Typically, like this study, um, the key barriers that people report are really about organizational structure. Uh, so the existing structure and ways of working of the enterprise are really the most important factor that's holding us back from our progress towards the digital enterprise. And so that's really what I, I want to adjust, uh, address today. We, uh, we have a research arm called ShiftBase, and we've just completed another study 
um, of executives in large companies, and we're releasing the results of that, um, I think, at the end of this week. Another factor that we see is that um, you know, the world outside is changing a lot more quickly than our organizations. So if you go into the little uh, square here, there's a Tesla uh, Model X, my favorite, and there's also an S as well. And there's no question that the speed with which Tesla has disrupted the auto industry has posed great challenges to German auto manufacturers and to worldwide auto manufacturers. Uh, they saw progress happening like this, and they had plans for the next five years, the next 10 years, and then suddenly somebody emerges over here. And it's, it's really posed a great challenge to them. And the big problem they have is not skill, expertise, technology, design. The problem they have is the nature of their organizations. The nature of their organizations is simply too slow to operate in the world that's emerging around them, and that needs to change. Uh, we often say that connected products require a connected company. You know, you can't be making smart home solutions, smart factory solutions, connected car solutions, if the inside of your company looks like a sort of late 19th century uh, social structure. It just doesn't work, okay? So this is probably the number one burning platform issue uh, for large enterprises in Europe today. There is this thing called Conway's Law. Uh, Conway's Law says that essentially all organizations are destined to produce products and services which are a mirror image of their own internal communication structure. And you can see that when you look at the website of a company. The website of a company often reflects typically their internal structure, not how the customer sees them or the experience that customers want. And so this is another reason why the organizational structure matters to the nature of products that we provide. I would say um, agility, responsiveness, adaptability. This is the main challenge that organizations face today. And I'm sure you'll have seen, this is uh, my friend Hugh doing a cartoon of John Husband's concept of the wirearchy, the networked world um, that's more important than the hierarchy um, that exists today. So um, we're very lucky. We have all kinds of new models and theories of the organization. We've got things like uh, holacracy, sociocracy. We've got sort of heterodox structures of various kinds based on circles. Uh, you know, team of teams is a variant of this model. Medium, Zappos, various case studies use this. We also have uh, a more um, interesting model, I think, that Spotify and others have pioneered, a truly agile organization consisting of multiple levels of tribes and guilds and chapters and squads and all these sort of different loose social structures that people can operate within in order to do better work. And then we have uh, you know, some very industrial scale versions of this model, um, such as the autonomous business units model used by the Chinese firm Haya. Um, and this is a model where leaders are sort of at the base of the, the pyramid, inverted. Uh, you have a shared services platform that deals with all the boring stuff like IT, HR, and so on. And then on top, you have individual autonomous business units that use that platform in order to create value for customers. Um, and that, I think, is closer to a model of the digital enterprise than anything that we have in Europe today. But the problem is that within a traditional enterprise, you simply cannot succeed with these structures. You can do it locally, you can do it in one business unit, you can do it in a sort of, uh, you know, a corner which is dedicated to innovation, but you simply cannot do it at enterprise scale today for all of these reasons. And if I look at these barriers, these top three barriers are the hardest to solve, they are currently the least likely to be solved, um, because it depends on people being brave enough to have some very difficult conversations with their board of management and with their executive. But these are the ones we need to focus on if we are to have a chance of building the digital enterprise. And these are what I will try and focus on today for the rest of this talk in giving you some thoughts about how to build stronger foundations for that digital enterprise. So, um, as I said, um, I think that you can help create these foundations. And there are two basic elements to achieving this. Number one, we need this organizational operating system. So what can take the place of a simple vertical hierarchy in terms of coordinating the work of employees and associates within the organization? That's what I'm defining as the, the operating system. Uh, 
And number two, how do we operate the system? What's the operating model that can allow us to adapt, to evolve, and to change over time? Because even if you design the perfect operating system and it's fixed, it will be out of date within you know, two years, three years, four years. So it needs to constantly evolve. And so we've got a structural um, foundation, and then we have a sort of evolutionary uh, model uh, as part of that foundation as well. So first of all, um, looking at the organizational operating system, if we consider what constitutes an organizational operating system today, we would say it's a management hierarchy, it's a set of processes, it's a set of directives, procedures, rules, um, and it's also the organizational culture, the way that things happen, the way people behave, acceptable norms of behavior in the organization today. And that's really how it's been for the last 100, 150 years um, in terms of our organizations. I think the future operating system will not be so manual, it will not be so difficult to operate, it will be a lot more automated, and it will be a lot more technology enhanced. So, when we consider um, how this operating system should look, I think there are some really useful lessons if we consider the history of software. Um, so, if we look back, you know, 20 years, in fact, I can't even remember when this, uh, when this was, but software used to be vertically integrated. You know, one software product would go all the way from the user interface through the sort of application logic, the data storage, all the way down to the metal, basically. And if you wanted to change something, you couldn't. You would just buy a better piece of software. You couldn't sort of adapt what was there already. Now, over time, what's happened is that software has evolved into a, like a layer cake, a series of individual layers, the data storage, the application logic, the sort of MVC structure of most software today, model view controller, and the APIs, the interfaces that connect those layers. And so if I take a piece of modern software and I want to make a mobile interface, I don't make a second product, I just create a new interface connected by um, an API to the existing system. And so this system of layers and interfaces um, and interoperability, that I think is a very useful metaphor for how our organizations should be structured. We have layers of processes, we have layers of rules, we have layers of management, and we have layers of sort of uh, operating uh, systems and operating models. So I think this is the metaphor I have in mind when I think about how to evolve the organization from something purely vertically uh, integrated to something horizontally integrated. Um, this is a slide from uh, Dave Gray, who wrote the book called The Connected Company, and he studied leading companies like Amazon and Nordstrom and various other companies like W.L. Gore, and he realized that what they had in common was they had this service-oriented architecture. In other words, individual uh, elements could be composed into services or into teams through service contracts, which are the sort of human equivalent of an API or an interface. And this, for him, is what enabled us to create the business as a platform strategy. So this is where we keep our standards, our rules, our constraints, our basic operating laws, so that on top of that platform, we can operate more freely with small teams, more autonomous working, more independence, and more, uh, you know, sort of more heterogeneity in terms of how work gets done. So this concept of business as a platform, for me, is actually very similar to software. It's, it's almost a software way of thinking about the organization, and I think it's the most powerful way that we have of thinking about the evolution of the operating system inside the enterprise today. Another lesson that we've taken from software is the idea of agile. You know, the agile manifesto, uh, was the product of years and years of IT failures and an examination of why these sort of traditional IT projects failed. And it really revolutionized the way that we make software. You know, we work in small iterative loops in an agile way and we sort of discover solutions um, along the way and we evolve them. We don't make a plan and then spend 10 million euros and then five years later discover that it failed. Um, which is the way that things used to happen. So I think agility and iterative processes are also something that we've taken from software into management. And I don't know, anyone use Waze as an app? Uh, yeah, one person at the back too. Waze is a, a very, very simple crowdsource navigation app. 
Uh, it's free, you can get it on your phone. Um, and what it does is it uses every single Waze user as a sort of human sensor. So it tracks your speed, it tracks when you're stopped. You can press buttons to tell it when you've seen the police or you've seen a, a, a speed control. And as a result, this crowdsourced navigation app is the very best navigation app you can find for big cities like London and San Francisco and LA, for example. So I have, I have like a, you know, a modern BMW navigation system in my car, paid lots of money for it, and it would regularly get me to work in about you know, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, pretty much the same roads every time. I did wonder why it would always take me the same, the same way. I started using Waze. I get to work in 40, 45 minutes every single day and the route is almost never the same uh, because it's using live information from other users. It's crowdsourcing intelligence about how we find our way and it is so much better than the professional navigation systems in cars. It's, it's almost a joke. And this is simply through the power of crowdsourcing and crowdsourcing needs a common platform. It needs people working on a common platform and just producing data that we can use to find our way in organizations. So I think there's another sort of metaphor there for the way that we can use our enterprise social networks, our intranets and our collaboration systems to help our companies find their way. So, in terms of examples of business as a platform, I mentioned Amazon. Um, you know, behind every widget, every part of an Amazon interface is a dedicated team who are obsessively monitoring real-time data about that small button's performance uh, or that small area of the website's performance. Pretty much everything is organized as a platform in Amazon, and so by creating a common platform, um, they allow a lot more freedom for people working on the technology to do different things because it's all connected. But it's not just technology firms that are using business as a platform to revolutionize their structures. Um, Hire is a fascinating company. Um, it produces what we call white goods, so fridges, washing machines, dishwashers, these sorts of things in China. It was a state enterprise. It produced terrible quality goods. And uh, this guy came in and just completely changed it around. He said, we're not going to produce rubbish. And in fact, he said, if you are more than two steps away from a customer, from now on, you're basically a secretary. And so suddenly, there was this flood of managers from the center, where they were powerful, to the edges of the organization. So he eff effectively inverted the pyramid um, of the structure of this company um, in a very, very short space of time. So he said, I turned it from a pyramid to a network. And then what he did was he focused on building a platform. So everything that Hire does, from transport to marketing, um, you know, to all the other core functions of the organization, has a common platform, and every single team that uses it is evolving towards becoming an independent business. So he's taken one big state enterprise, he's boiled it down to a platform of services, and then he's told everyone, every team working on top, you now have your own profit and loss statement. You are now an independent company. You are free to trade wherever you want, make as much money as you want, but you use the higher platform, and that means you can use the higher brand. And that was a really revolutionary um, organizational design move um, that's meant that Hire has been successful against all of the sort of international companies who've tried to enter the Chinese market um, and, and uh, take business away from them. So it's a very interesting case study. There's lots of good case studies written about uh, this company in the literature. So um, for me, business as a platform is currently probably the only viable alternative we have to a vertically oriented hierarchy as a central nervous system or a sort of skeleton for organizing the structure of our company. Hierarchy is not bad per se. It's a natural feature of human organizations. It denotes power. It denotes relationships between people. That's all fine, okay? But when you use hierarchy as a way of coordinating work in a 21st century company, you're making a huge mistake because it's overly bureaucratic, it's incredibly slow, and it doesn't use the talent and the skill of the employees at the lower levels of the hierarchy. It's just the wrong model. You can use it to denote status, you can still have a hierarchy in place, or what we call a minimum viable hierarchy, but you don't need to use it to coordinate work or communication within the organization. So, we need a better way to coordinate work. We need to start cutting those strings so that our puppets 
uh, become actors. And the platform is what gives them a stage on which to work more freely, express themselves, do more work, create more value, and connect with each other um, in more meaningful ways than they can through a hierarchy. If you look at the worst behaviors in any company today, they are often the product of closed communication that goes up and down a hierarchy. So I'm working with um, one law firm at the moment, and they explained to me that they had a very small procurement issue that started right at the bottom of the organization, and it went through successive emails, one-to-one -one between managers, until nobody wanted to decide on it, and it went all the way to the board. And then the board said, you know, seriously, is this how we run the company? Um, you know, we're going to make a 500 uh, euro purchasing decision. And that's because communicating in closed channels, email, up and down a hierarchy, brings out the very worst in human beings, yeah? Even I am a jerk on email if I'm talking to people I manage from time to time. But we use Slack, and if I'm a jerk in Slack, everybody can see it, and so I don't do it. So open communication within lateral structures produces much better human behavior and much more efficient ways of coordinating work than up and down the hierarchy, in my view. Um, so the way that we see this is that the challenge for the digital enterprise is to build out this sort of common service platform. So if you look at functions like IT, procurement, and HR, today they have power over workers, which is crazy. Um, the building management people don't come in and tell me how to consume oxygen, um, but the IT people will come in and tell me what computer to use, what software to use, how to plug into the network, all these things. They should be an enabling function, and they should get out of the way of people doing the work, in my view. Um, I have to keep saying, in my view, in case I offend anyone. So the way that we see this is people working in these background functions, their role is to produce microservices and services that people working on the platform, the actors, can use in order to do their work better. So if somebody up here says, I'm working on a customer journey that requires, let's say, a better pricing calculator, they define the service recipe for the service they want to consume, and then they put it together from individual sort of data services and information services that exist underneath the platform. So this is the basic sort of schema of a service-oriented platform within an organization. And what it means is you can operate any structure on top. It can be circles, it can be tribes, guilds, whatever you want, um, because you, you know that it's compliant with your rules and it's compliant with your procedures because they're encoded in the platform. You know, you don't rely on somebody reading 100 pages of central directives from the, from the executive. You encode those rules in the platform, people use the platform, and that means that you're all working in the same way and you're all compliant with the same rules. So I hope that doesn't sound too, uh, too sort of complicated, but this is a model that we already see uh, with the Amazons and the hires of this world, and we are also seeing with some of the leading companies trying to develop today. And you can, I hope you're already starting to see that those of you that work on an enterprise social network, you're at the heart of this, yeah? That communication and coordination layer is right bang in the middle of what we need to build. And that means that you have a much more central and important future um, than maybe you realize today. So we know that our phones have a platform that we manage conservatively and we can't mess with, and then we have apps on top that do all kinds of wonderful things, you know? That basic structure is what we'll see in business as a platform going forward. Tightly managed platform plus free, autonomous, loose apps that serve very specific uh, business needs. So what's good about this? Well, platforms enable new management. Um, if you look at this rather overstated article recently, excess management costs the US $3 trillion a year. Um, and I think in Europe, my experience is there's way too much uh, senior management that's not really performing meaningful functions in the organization beyond political control and coordination, um, because that's what's needed. In the future, I think a lot of middle management will be algorithmic. You know, it, it won't be the lowest level jobs that disappear, it'll be the middle management jobs, which are about just taking information from one place to another and doing some analysis in Excel. All of that stuff we can automate, it's not a problem, okay? So we are gonna see a lot of change in management, and I think what we'll see emerge is a better form of management, more a form of leadership, 
on top of these platforms rather than bureaucratic management as we see today. So we can embed our rules and our processes um, in software and if we want to pursue a future of AI or chatbots or all of the cool stuff we're reading about today, none of that's possible without a common data platform. It's really that simple. Um, also, in a future where we have cobots, like this lovely friendly cobot over here, um, a cobot being a robot who works with people, again, that needs a platform that can do both human interaction and machine interaction at the same time. So a lot of the things that we want to do in the future are really only possible um, using this sort of model. And I think what's interesting for me is that your internal uh, collaboration layer or your so, uh, social network layer, that's the base for building much of this stuff on. And so I think that's really the next stage of that foundation. So briefly, um, the new operating model that I have in mind is actually very simple. Um, we don't know what the future is. We talk about these VUCA conditions of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, um, and ambiguity. We don't know what the future operating model needs to be, but what we do know is that we need to adapt. And right now, our organizations are not very good at adaptation. So we can use our ESNs and we can use our internal platforms to help. So the first thing is, as I mentioned with uh, Waze, the navigation app, your enterprise social network is a network of human sensors. It's all the people in your company, and if you ask them questions, you know, do you like the cafe? Was the food good today? You know, are we good at innovating? There's a million questions you can ask them, which today are only asked in annual employee surveys, uh, which is ridiculous. And they can guide you. you know, they can guide the development of the capabilities that we need in an organization if you ask them. So if you're suffering from weak use cases on the enterprise social network, or people think it's just a communication channel or a chat channel, and they're lacking a meaningful reason to use it, there's a meaningful reason right there. I think we do too much measurement of adoption and how many comments and how many posts and all this kind of stuff. None of that really matters. What matters is the organizational capabilities we're creating for the, for the new enterprise. And that's what we should be measuring. And it's actually pretty easy to do so. So we start to talk to companies in terms of, OK, you know, if this is your future, if these are your challenges, then what capabilities, what new superpowers does your organization need in order to, uh, to cope with it? And then we sort of organize them into these sort of broad categories here. And then we say, fine, how do you measure it? And in some cases, you can measure with data. In other cases, you can only measure by asking people, is it working? And that's a really simple process that's very similar to our sort of quantified self world. You know, my watch gives me praise just for standing up, uh, which, you know, with a rather weak sense of self, um, I value very highly indeed. Um, but what we've proved with these things is that instead of going on a diet or going to the gym in, in January and giving the gym up in February, if we are always doing small change actions with feedback and data, actually people do keep to that stuff. It's a more sustainable model of change and it works. And so we need to do the same for the organization. We need the quantified organization where we're allowing people in the networks to sort of tell you, is the organization good at this capability or is it improving or is it getting worse? And I think that's a way that we can, that we can move forward. So on a very practical level, um, you know, for people who are working on these internal platforms, um, I think there are some simple things we can do. One um, is a communications challenge gather and share stories of change, you know, stories of better behavior, stories of innovation, stories of new things which are possible even in the tired old structures. Uh, that's a really powerful thing, you know, people respond to stories and I think we need more communications people working in these social networks in order to do that job in a better way. Not traditional corporate communications, the PDF with the smiley face and the, the bullshit, but you know, actual real, uh, real stories that we can share. Second one is, uh, and this we've seen in some of the leading companies we've worked with, recruit a change agent network openly tell the company, hey, if you're interested in new ways of working, come and join us. We'll give you cool stuff. We'll let you go to conferences. We'll share interesting articles with you, and we'll support you. And you be our eyes and ears out there in the organization that can help other people 
uh, work in a better way or use Slack or adopt these new tools and technologies, etc. It's a really powerful force. In, in Bosch, every year, there's four, 400, 500 people get together um, in Stuttgart, and they are amazing. They really feel like the future of that company. They're well-informed, they're enthusiastic, they just get on and do things, and that's the sort of change agent network that we've seen develop over the last few years around their sort of central uh, transformation projects. Another one, and this is a mistake that we all uh, often make with enterprise social networks, is think in terms of intimacy and scale. You know, don't think that everything should be a community, um, because communities tend to exist you know, only on a certain level of scale. So we have our teams, and our teams are very intimate, and teams use things like Slack, or real-time chat, or intimate tools, where we get to know each other and we work together. Go up a level to the sort of department level, and maybe that's where you see communities of practice uh, or communities working around a certain topic. And then at the higher level, we're talking about networks. We're not talking about communities. You know, the only way that you can join 10,000 people together is in a network. They're not a community. Uh, you don't get communities of 100,000 people in, in the real world that know each other. So use different approaches, use different technologies for those different levels of scale and then think about how you can do this work of asking people what needs to happen at those different levels. The questions at the top are going to be broad, the questions at the bottom are going to be very intimate, very specific, very direct. They're not the same. Uh, and so that's one way, I think, of informing the actions that you do. But really what it comes down to is a very simple process of asking people in the organizations what new ca capabilities do they need in order to do their work better at these different levels, and then you try and create some uh, you know, basic change actions, some tweaks, some new techniques, or some big projects uh, in some cases that address those needs and create those new capabilities. And obviously a great source of this is for you to be capturing as much data and as much feedback and pain points from the employees as possible. So you can be a conduit, you can gather this stuff and then actually tell the organization, look, We've got some issues here, you know, we need to fix some things, or we can improve, we can do things in a better way. Um, the way that we talk about um, bringing this to life is through the concept of agile user stories. So one of the great things about the agile movement was it went from the idea of requirements in a software product, which were captured in Excel, like, for example, if you're designing a car, requirements might say uh, four circles and a rectangle, and you could you know, expect a Porsche and be given a Škoda, and it would meet the requirements perfectly well, even though the Škoda probably cost 10 million euros, but you know, that's, that's IT projects for you. Um, so what Agile did was Agile came in and said, no, let's think about the customer, and let's talk about Agile user stories. In other words, as a saleswoman, I want to be able to get in context, real-time data on this customer from historical records so that I can talk to them more intelligently in the meeting. You know, that's a human readable story that you can test because you can ask the saleswoman, did that work? You know, does that capability exist? And when you start to express your change actions or your transformation actions, in that sort of human language, which is human testable, then I think the whole process of change gets a lot easier and a lot more doable. So that's what we do. We help um, organizations sort of coordinate this list of this backlog um, of potential change actions, put some measures behind them so that we know what's going on, sometimes through data, but most often through human feedback, and then just iterate. Uh, just go around small loops of small actions done over and over again, reflecting on the results, reflecting on the data, so that you can demonstrate that your platform that you're working on is not just a place for people to talk or to talk about the debate last night between uh, uh, Trump and Clinton. You know, your platform is a place where people are meaningfully discussing the improvement of their work and the improvement and the evolution of their organization. So just to conclude, I think we've got to go beyond simple communication use cases on collaboration platforms and on enterprise social networks, and we need to turn them into the foundation of a platform for a new operating system for the digital enterprise. And I think um, that challenge is really where we should be going as practitioners uh, from here. In other words, 
put down the adoption metrics, you know, stop worrying about what people are doing on the platform in terms of uh, communication, and try and use your platform as an engine for change and part of the future operating system uh, for your organization. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.